In addition to his lecture tonight, he's also an artist in residence, and he's going to be doing a, a mural upstairs from the dean's office in the freshman wing. Uh, so look for that, and that'll be coming maybe in the next month or so. Um, and ever since I've, <coughs> ever since I've known uh, Bo, I've been uh, a huge fan of his work. Uh, we met back in 2012 um, in Toronto, maybe, together. And then there's this other guy who's here, um, Alex, as well. And so it's kind of interesting. We were all hanging out in Toronto, and now we're back here. I mean, I live here, but those guys are back here. <laughs> Again, doing projects in Detroit and then doing stuff here in the one set. And Alex was saying it's interesting to see how the careers have developed. Um, since 2012, since we were back there, and one thing that he pointed out, we both know this, is that Bo's career has skyrocketed. Um, it's amazing to see the incredible work that he's been doing all around the world. So, I'm um, really excited. I'm not going to say anything more because the work speaks for itself, and I'll give the floor to you. So. Great, thanks. Hey guys, uh, I'm going to try to project. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Back all okay. I have a little bit of a like a allergy thing going on, so if I start coughing, I'll try to keep it to a minimum. Um, I'm really happy to be back in Michigan. Um, I'm in New York City most of the time, and uh, but I have a special relationship with Detroit, and um, I try to get back out here as often as I can. So I'll tell you guys a little bit about uh, what's been bringing me back here, uh, as well as a lot of my other projects that I've been doing. Um, around the world, and particularly uh, how I transitioned from studio practice to public work, and how that uh, has been changing, and, and just all the excitement around creating murals and public work, and uh, just the tremendous explosion that's occurred in the, about the last 10 years. Uh, so just to give you guys a little bit of context about what the part of the art world that I exist in. So uh, primarily, I was I went to school and I learned how to paint and draw. And that was my bread and butter, still is. And uh, it's sort of was the launching point for me into my art career, which was uh, my studio practice, creating oil paintings. And it's what led to my first opportunity uh, as, a, as a working artist. So I graduated from the Laguna College of Art and Design in Southern California in 2008. Uh, I grew up near there, so stayed close to home. Uh, as soon as I was done with my BFA, I immediately moved to New York City and was working as a freelance illustrator. So the chops that I had learned uh, getting my BFA, uh, drawing and painting, came in really handy with that. But it wasn't quite enough. You know, I, I, was, I was still looking for some sort of entree into the actual art world. So I, uh, I got very fortunate. And I responded to uh, a Craigslist ad that uh, a pretty famous artist had put out. His name is Ron English. And uh, I became his studio assistant. And I worked for him for about five years as I was developing my own work, uh, learning about the art world from him, and, uh, and refining my practice. So um, these are just some of my oil paintings from earlier in my career. And. Uh, so, so as, I, as I got into uh, deeper and deeper into creating these images that were very uniquely my own, uh, I thought it would be interesting to use some of the skills that I was learning from my boss at the time. And he, he really made his name by, uh, he's sort of the godfather of modern street art. And so, so I was trying to figure out how to translate what I was doing in oil uh, into other media and eventually into the street. So one of the first translations that I did was actually in a stained glass. Um, and this was the, sort of the, the graphic nature of the paintings that I had been doing sort of translated pretty seamlessly. And um, so similar imagery, uh, but a totally different studio practice. It was uh, a lot of learning on the fly. And so eventually, I got enough of this work together to where I put together an exhibition uh, in, in the UK, in Bristol. And it's actually in this, this crypt. It's a 12th century crypt. And so this was sort of one of the first uh, instances of, of taking my work out of the studio, out of the gallery, 
and uh, bringing it to an unexpected place. So, so this is called the Crypt of St. John the Baptist. And uh, we, we installed all of these uh, stained glass pieces here. And I mean, there's, there are people buried here. It's a very unconventional space, obviously. <laughs> Uh, but I loved it. So I loved uh, being able to have, a, have work in a space and have people stumble across it and not know that they were going to be viewing art. So <laughs> I don't have a photo of, of the front of this place, but you were walking, you'd be walking down the street and there'd be a tiny little door, like med medieval door, because people were small then, I guess. Uh, and, and people would kind of peek in and then they would walk through the door and they would come upon this unexpected art experience. And uh, to this day, that's one of my favorite things about making art uh, in the street uh, is that unexpected uh, quality that the people are walking to work, uh, they're, they're going to school, they're doing something that they're not walking to the white walled gallery or museum. They don't have to, to make, take that extra step on a Sunday. Uh, it's just something that they can experience. It's, it's like a really pure form uh, of viewing art, in my opinion. So this is one of my early pieces in Queens, New York. And uh, it was something that I created fairly quickly and wanting to really uh, incorporate it into the, the building, into the, into the uh, context of the wall and the, and the brick and everything. So it's, it's really just trying to make something seem like it belongs, uh, even though it's clearly an unexpected thing. Uh, something in Hamburg, Germany. This was actually in a soccer stadium. Another one in Queens. So, you, so I'm going through... Uh, sort of chronologically here, you'll see a, a bit of an evolution in the, the visual imagery. So <clears throat> I started getting some traction and I was invited to Berlin to actually paint on a piece of the, the Berlin Wall. This is one of those chunks that was salvaged. And this shot was just uh, a, great, a great opportunity to catch this thing just in midair, which was pretty incredible. Uh, this is in Rome, another instance of trying to fuse my art with a, a texture and, a, and the, a history that exists in, um, you know, in, in this other place. So this, this wall, I saw it from, uh, from down the street and I thought immediately that I, I needed to paint on that texture because it would lend itself uh, so well to my aesthetic. And uh, even, I even actually left a lot of this graffiti. Uh, it actually, in the, the Roman dialect, uh, Quadraro is actually a, the neighborhood. Um, so it says Quadraro in the heart, I guess is the uh, thing. So I, I didn't want to go over it. I wanted to incorporate it into the, into the piece. So it's just, it's just great being able to interact with people uh, that you would never really see. This is in London, um, Brick Lane, back in Brooklyn. Uh, this is a piece for Converse, commercial piece, but San Diego. This is back in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, Los Angeles, Little Italy, Los Angeles. So every wall creates a challenge. Um, you have to react to the, all these variables that you would, would uh, not normally encounter in the studio. This was by far the most challenging piece I've ever encountered. This is in Dubai. And I, I, I was invited to participate in this project. And the, they told me the size of the wall. And I was very excited about it. And then about a week before I was set to to go there to paint. They send me the final photo of the wall. And it has these strange angled bricks. It's not flat. So how do you paint a mural on a wall that's not flat? It's, it's, I was panicking. It was a really, it was a tough, tough thing. So eventually, I came up with the idea that I would create a lenticular so that it was really the only solution. So that as you view the, the mural from, from one side, it uh, looks like a man's face here. And then from the other, if it becomes a female face. So as you can see from the, from the front view, it sort of just becomes this, this sea of hair and, <laughs> and texture. Um, but this was, this was probably one of the most extreme instances of having to respond to the variables of a wall. Um, and this is actually a little, a little gif of uh, walking around it, just to give you a little more perspective. Really fun in the end, very stressful at first, of course. So this is, uh, this is a, an image of the finished uh, sort of house intervention that I did two years ago. And this is near Eastern Market in Detroit. And it's a really interesting house. This one, I believe it was built by Cranbrook 
architecture students as a, sort of a, an experiment on how you could make something out of with thirty thousand dollars or something, and uh, eventually it was it, uh, some people lived there. Then it uh, fell into disrepair and was sold by the land bank. And, and uh, these guys <clears throat> that allowed me to paint it were working with the mural festival. Uh, actually, I'm working with them this week as well. They're called Murals in the Market. So, uh, so this this was a great opportunity for me. Uh, come back to Detroit. I had I had been coming here for a few years, and uh, this was sort of a dream come true to paint something, um, paint all four sides of a building like this. And it's it's in the middle of this this big field. You know, everything else around it has been uh, demolished. But um, anyway, so it's it's sort of a an homage to Detroit for me. A lot of so the so this is this classical figure here. This this uh, head is based off of a Greco-Roman sculpture. But the crown is very um, <clears throat> intentional. It's it's a sort of cobbled together architecture from Detroit, uh, particularly the Brush Park neighborhood. So a lot of what's in there doesn't exist anymore. Some of it does. Some of it's been rehabbed. Uh, but I I, uh, I just have been so taken with a lot of that uh, that architecture. That I thought it would be great to have an opportunity to work it into an image like this. Uh, another piece in New York City. This was actually in the courtyard of a men's shelter, Brooklyn, Denmark. I'm going to get, I'm almost done with the, uh, the murals here and then I'll get into the next uh, aspect of my work. This is probably the largest piece I've ever done in Eugene, Oregon. That's, that's about a city block. If you could see a little person down there. But uh, I had to do this one all on scaffold. So uh, Miami, uh, this is the most most recent piece that I'd done, which is sort of a a uh, different take on the same crown image. But you'll notice the architecture in the crown is not uh, the same. This is actually from Jersey City, so all these buildings are cobbled together uh, from historic districts there. So it's really uh, it's a great time to be making public art. There is a lot of interest in murals particularly related to development these days, which is a bit of a, can be a kind of a sticky um, territory for, for an artist. Uh, there's, there's a lot, you know, you can make a living doing this, you get, you get to travel the world, you get to do all kinds of great projects, um, but sometimes you have to worry about, um, I guess, the, the integrity of the projects because the, the G word is a big one nowadays, gentrification, and artists are oftentimes blamed for being the, the, the tip of the spear. And uh, so, that, so it's tough, uh, but it's, it's also a great opportunity. You just kind of have to be careful um, with who you work with. So in this case, this is a city, uh, city project, and um, I was really happy to, to be able to add something to this, to this one. Um, all right, this is probably the, the height of, of excitement for me in creating some sort of a par public art happening. So we were talking about having un art in unexpected places. This is in Times Square in New York. And there is this fantastic program called Midnight Moment. And what happens is all of the sign operators in Times Square donate three minutes a night uh, for a piece of public video art. And it, it's played for uh, three minutes just before midnight for an entire month. So I had, I had this for July of 2016. And uh, it was the most surreal experience. And one of, the, one of my favorite parts of it was just to show up there just before, watch all the tourists walking around, and just see this thing go on, and have all these people not expecting to see art. They were just expecting to see, to see advertising. Um, and uh, it was incredible. So I'll show you just a couple of shots of this, as well as a short video. Just give you some, an idea of what it was like. You can see all the way, like four, Four blocks down, it was, I think it was playing on maybe three dozen, four dozen screens at the same time, all through Times Square. The idea was that it, it would, you were sort of looking out of this, <laughs> this, uh, this porthole window, uh, and it's first person experience as if Times Square itself is a ship that has been uh, drug underneath the waves by a, by a giant kraken. So. There's a little, a little, a little more of that. This is another, another clip. All kinds of uh, nautical lore and fantastical creatures and things pop up. So, 
All right. So now back to Detroit. Uh, last year I had the, the opportunity to do a residency for three months at the Red Bull House of Art. And uh, it, was, it was a great opportunity to try some new things and to really spend more time than I've ever spent um, in this area. So I started off by, by looking around and, and I, I get very inspired by uh, pre-modern architecture in particular. And, and so I did a lot of exploring and I ended up finding some really amazing materials that, that were just laying around. And it's, it made me think that I'd want to try a whole new process. Uh, you guys saw how I did stained glass for a while. Um, I decided to, to go into mosaics for this, uh, for this residency. So I, f I found all the salvage material, started, started breaking it down and building images. Uh, very laborious process, sort of felt like, a, um, like I was cataloging uh, artifacts or something. Um, and then I started constructing these images, very much trying, trying to create something that, that felt like it was from another time. Um, so this is one of the first ones that I had done. This is actually a close-up of some interlocking gears. And what's, what's wild about it, seeing it up on the screen there, is it almost becomes like little paint swatches. You know, and you, you almost have to squint your eyes to, uh, to get things to come into focus. Um, this is another one. It's uh, got glass, brick, ceramic tile. There's actually some Poivic tile in there that was donated to me that had been taken out of an old school that was demolished. Um, so a lot of fun. This was, this was the biggest piece from the, the residency, which is uh, about 8 by 12 feet. I think there's, we calculated that there are probably about 80,000 individual hand-broken pieces in this one. It's the bane of my existence for about two weeks. <laughs> uh, so so after, uh, after that, I, I, it really just blew the door open, uh, and I just decided to start uh, experimenting with more light-based pieces. This is uh, something from my most recent solo exhibition in Los Angeles. Uh, again, themes of uh, you know, taking from the past. The, these, are, uh, these patterns are sort of um, inspired by ro uh, Gothic rose windows. Um, and this is a dodecahedron that's constructed out of these. This is one of the two-dimensional pieces. So, this looks like stained glass, but it's actually made entirely out of modern processes and materials. Uh, CNC routed wood, uh, aerosol, acrylic, um, and uh, so one of the main theme themes for me is really just pushing the work forward and, uh, and trying to see what I can make in, in different environments. You know, I get to travel so much. Uh, it's great to be able to create things that are specific to a place. And at this time, I had access to all of these machines, and it just it felt like the right, uh, the right direction at the right time. There's another smaller one here. And these are some more of those uh, polyhedron hedrons. Uh, then the net, the you know I I did this other uh, let's see this this is taking it into um, stop motion animation this is kind of a fun little little loop that I made for another exhibition earlier this year so you'll recognize some familiar images that have been translated into this uh, surreal landscape um, let's see is there audio. There's no speakers in here, are there? I don't think so. There are? Turning it up, but it's not. It doesn't matter. It's just ambient noise. It's fine. There is that quarter inch. This guy. Yeah, it should be going through here. It doesn't. It's fine. It's fine. Um, this is a more straightforward animation. So, so basically, um, sort of covered how I went from being a painter uh, into into other mediums, and then really the uh, the primary direction that takes up most of my time has been the public work, and uh, and this this piece has actually been used as a projection in, intervention in a lot of different public spaces. 
supposed to be sort of like a living, breathing painting. All right. So I've got a few of these videos that I think would be very helpful to, or great to just have playing um, while we maybe I can engage with you guys a little bit if you have any questions. Um, because these things can get a little hypnotic. Uh, <laughs> Steve, did you, uh, do you, do you want to start this off? Do you have anything you want to, anything that I didn't hit on that you were? Oh, yeah, go right ahead. So you had mentioned uh, the draw to the street from uh, at more gallery shows. And you, you described it, you used the word pure, that, that you felt like there was, there was more of a pure expression uh, as people stumbled across it. My question is, is twofold. How, how, do you, how did you come to that realization? What do you mean when you, when you use the word pure to describe it? And then how do you maintain that purity? Or do you try to maintain that purity now that you've gone back into the gallery space? With some of these yeah, I, I, I've, I've never had any problem working in the gallery. I think it's, it's, it's a great opportunity to create things in a controlled environment. But I do think a lot of people are intimidated by, the, by a gallery or a museum. And a lot of people don't think that art is for them. But when you have art in public spaces, it's, it's totally democratized, and everybody can enjoy it. And people don't have to feel like you know, someone's going to expect them to buy something by walking in the door. So I think in that sense, it's pure, because it can just be a part of someone's everyday life. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Level, I think about leveling the playing field with the corporations, uh -huh. right? Because they they get to purchase advertising space and invade our public space with, without our permission, really. So it's kind of fun for us as artists to be able to also invade that space without people's permission, and they they get to kind of randomly come on, you know, come and experience it. Absolutely. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of people that work in. In the in the public realm that I think have have adopted that same view, right. which is which is great. Um, as you can see from my work, a lot of it, uh, it you know, it's all sanctioned. I'm, I've never been a graffiti artist as much as as uh, people who do p uh, illegal work. I you know, I'm friends with a lot of these guys. My mentor is one of them. You know, um, but uh, it is it is great to reclaim some of that public space, even if only for three minutes a night in Times Square. <laughs> Somebody made a joke to me uh, when I was telling them how great the product was. They said, well, to see your work, how many ads do I have to watch? Because like, <laughs> you're like so, you know, while you're standing there, you're so bombarded. Um, I thought it was worth it, but you know, it's fine. Yes? It would be interesting for us to hear about your process from concept development, you know, the steps you take to completion, and negotiating yeah. with the landlord or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So. I guess I could get into a little bit of just the pure, the image purely how I how I develop these. You know, it's a it's a layered process, so uh, I'm constantly kind of searching for uh, for historic ornamentation. You'll see, you know, a lot of these things in here are are sort of cobbled together from things I found on old doorknobs or tin ceilings or plates or letterpress, and uh, so I have sort of this crazy library of these things, and and uh, a lot of my process is actually digital. So uh, I'll create the images in Photoshop before I paint them, which comes in handy when you're trying to get permission from somebody to paint on their building. So you have something that's pretty close to what it's going to be. Uh, and funny enough, it actually made translating the images into animations a lot easier as well. If you already have things all built digitally, uh, it helps to be able to, um, to just grab a, an element and, and throw it into a different context. So um, more specifically about painting a building, there's so many different scenarios uh, of how you, you could go about that. I think uh, the best is usually when someone approaches me and says, we, we've got this great spot, uh, and here's a budget, and what would you like to do? It's not always that easy, though. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm going to go skip over to the corner. I think these yep. Mm -hmm. I was wondering why you chose that. Yeah, so, uh, so that's definitely a recurring, a recurring theme in the work. I'll put on this other animation, which uh, also has that. Uh, so I, 
When I moved to New York, I moved to a part of Brooklyn called Red Hook, and it's, it's a waterfront neighborhood. There used to be all long, longshoremen there, and docks, and dry docks, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> still to this day, it's an active port. There's, uh, you, outside of my studio window, you can see uh, tugboats and barges and all kinds of stuff. And, and really, I think it was just osmosis. Like, the stuff started just kind of working its way in, into my paintings. And um, visually, it's interesting. I like, I like the kind of metaphorical significance of these rusty ships that are sinking or about to sink. Or um, in this case, we've got this man-powered submarine here. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an aesthetic choice, but it's also, it, it, it also was definitely a product of the environment. Uh, where I really built this whole visual language. So, good question. Yeah? And I have two questions. The first one is, what are the, your budgetary ramifications behind this? How do you control, manage your budget behind working on these projects? So, well, it totally depends. Uh, some of them are done completely on a shoestring. Some are self-funded. Some are publicly funded. Like you, you saw that piece I did in Jersey City, The Last Mural, that was I think that was uh, grant funded through the city. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll approach my close collectors and <clears throat> see if we can cobble together a budget for a pop-up show like that stained glass thing that was all traded with the promise of art in the future. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question because really, you know, as, as much as you just want to create art, you have to worry about how it's going to be paid for it in the end. Um, Anybody else? Yeah. How long did it take you to roughly do your straight art paintings? So uh, it usually runs somewhere between four and 20 days, really, depending. <laughs> What's funny about creating murals is that it takes so much less time than creating a, an oil painting in the studio. Uh, it's bizarre. It's really strange. You'd think it would just you know, like the square footage, like how long it takes you to create one square foot, that you just multiply it by the wall. But it's, it's, uh, the resolution is different, the techniques are different. Um, really, I think you're just more energized when you're outside and you have this big this canvas. Like, <laughs> the brushes are bigger, that helps, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it, yeah, the short answer is it really depends on the size and the complexity. But typically, it takes about the same amount of time as making a, a medium painting in the studio, so. I know you've had a question for a long time. So uh, aside from the, the being sanctioned their legality, how do you distinguish your work, your street art work, from graffiti? You kind of made a distinction earlier. Um, OK, well, that I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, no, it's a really good question. Well, I'm going to try to, to choose my words wisely. Um, so, so I think that the term graffiti is very overused now. And like if you go to England, what I do, they call it graffiti. Anything that's on the street, you know, oh, actually this really funny thing happened. I was painting this piece uh, there a few years ago and they have these street art tours now. It's like, a, it's like an industry. And, uh, and I'm standing on the ladder and then I, this woman comes around the corner with about 30 people. She says, here we have a genuine graffiti artist painting in the street. And she was so excited because, you know, these people were all paying her for this experience. And, uh, and I looked over and I said, actually, I'm not really a graffiti artist for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, these aren't letter forms because, to me, graffiti uh, is all about letter forms. And that's, what that art, that's where that art form came from. And secondly, this is, I have permission to do this. It's the middle of the day. <laughs> so graffiti can mean something that's illegal. It definitely means letter forms, uh, but it just really depends who you ask. It's it's kind of a topic of debate right now. So yeah, I think people are still within the movement are determining what what is the it, It's yeah, also it's an yeah back and forth discussion, and actually <coughs> some of the old timey graffiti writers out there will call street art a regression mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's it's become in their eyes like more of a sellout, more of a you know there's. There's people traveling the world and getting paid to do this, and these guys like, you know, made it by painting trains at night and being arrested and having a record and like running around. So it's, it's well, it was an discussion. It was an ins insular culture, yeah. 
and and street art is not. It's it's much more inclusive. It's yeah, and easier to commercialize. So there's give and take, right? Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Another question I'd like to ask is: I noticed you have the Chuck Taylor Converse. Yep. <laughs> I'm wearing them right now, actually. They're paying me to wear these right, right now. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not. <laughs> so I, I think um, he's wearing them just because they're kind of an iconic sneaker. Um, but, but yeah, actually, I originally created this image for a Converse sponsored thing. I was on, it was on the back cover of Juxtapose. So they, basically, they'd pay for the mural to be made, and then they'd put it on the back cover of Juxtapose. Um, I didn't have to put the shoes in there, but I just kind of. <laughs> Where are we getting those from? Mules in the market? Yeah, these, they give these out a lot. Yeah. So my main question is: Have you ever been approached by any other advertising opportunities by any chance? Yes. So that's a very sticky thing too. You guys are, so, you guys are hitting all the. Th all the yeah, no, that's a really, really good question. So because because uh, because street art is graffiti's more approachable cousin, you know, it's like. And there's a lot of a lot of companies, a lot of corporations want to like seize that that uh, right nowness, that cool factor, whatever you want to call it. And uh, and so yes, a lot of a lot of companies and ad campaigns and you know advertising agencies are always trying to get uh, street art in their I don't know in their shoots or in their in their branding somehow. Um, funny story. <laughs> Uh, McDonald's shot a uh, a, uh, a commercial in Brooklyn for some new bagel burger that was coming out in the Netherlands, and they wanted to make this this ad campaign very New York. Yeah, you know, this is not for an American audience. This is for how people view New York in the Netherlands, I guess. Right? That's what they're going for. And they ended up incidentally catching a lot of murals that uh, from artists who did not sign off, including mine. And uh, we ended up getting some legal counsel, and they had to pay us some money. And it was great, because <laughs> the, they shouldn't have done that. And we never would have worked with them anyway. You know, it's just, it, it becomes a, a factor of people calling me saying, we just saw your, uh, you know, on, online, we saw your mural in the background of this McDonald's ad. Did you, you, you working with them now? What's, what's up with that? That's exactly and I said, that. yeah, and it's just, it's not, you know, it, our images are, are all we you know really own. It, it's 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 our it's our brand as an artist. It's it represents uh, it represents who you are. So if my if if an image that I created is being attached to a brand that does something I don't agree with, uh, I'm not going to want to work with them. Right. So how that, sorry, how does that relate to copyright laws in the U.S. where we're working in the public realm, photographing the public realm isn't owned by you? It actually is. Yeah, I'm really curious because that seems well, there, there's 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 several ongoing there's several ongoing lawsuits about this right now. Yeah. There's a thing called VARA actually, which is takes it even a step further, uh, which says that uh, the actual physical image on a building that I do not own, uh, I have to sign away the rights for for that uh, building owner to whitewash that. Now that exists in law. It's not often defended. Um, there's a really interesting, I'll, I know I'm going a little bit further than your question, I'll get back to that in just a second. But this is how, uh, it's really, uh, really important conversation right now. There's, uh, there was this graffiti mecca in Queens, New York called Five Points. And uh, it was a rapidly gentrifying area. Uh, I don't know how many hundreds of artists painted this building. They were invited there by the landlord at the time. Then the landlord sold it or he was developing it, or they were going to tear it down. And, and all the artists were fighting this, because it's, or the community was actually fighting it. it was, this, this is a landmark. This is, oh, this is our neighborhood. This is, this is a really important part of our community. And it started turning into this big controversy. So the landlord had the whole building whitewashed in the middle of the night to just quash it. But it ended up backfiring, because the artists got representation. The lawyers brought up VARA. And they are, they, it was going to trial. Like it wasn't, th it was actually, it, everybody said it was going to get thrown out. And then, uh, and now it's actually going to trial. So these artists might actually get compensated. <laughs>
because their work was painted over. So let me get one more thing. The, the intellectual property rights of w one of my murals, somebody pays me to paint on their building. It's their building. They cannot take a photograph of my mural, put it on t-shirts, and sell it just because it's their building. I, if somebody buys a painting in a gallery, they own the physical painting. They can't take a picture of that painting, sell prints of it. They can't, they can't profit from it. They can't do whatever they want. They can put it in a commercial. Uh, the, the rights of the intellectual property of an image are completely different from the physical thing as well. So does that, does that kind of answer your question? And it's, it's different to views of the public realm. So as, in, it, as an architect, yeah. um, you don't have, in North America, it's different in other countries, but right. you don't have control over anybody who takes an image of your building. Right. And they can from the right of way. Right, from the right, right of way. That's the and same in, other country, like yeah. France, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Even it doesn't matter who takes it. Yeah. If you take a picture of it, it's owned by the designer or the uh -huh. architect or the artist. That's but interesting. In the U.S., the way I understand it, is that yeah. from the right way. As long as you're in the public right. realm, any photograph of anything taken, so you can produce a piece of design. Mm -hmm. So somebody could take a photograph and they could sell their image because they own the image. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what's in the image. Mm -hmm. and so I was curious. It, if it's a conflict with what you're saying. Well. Um, I think it still is a hotly it, contested. This is this is what corporations think oftentimes, and which is why you know this was overlooked by McDonald's and many other uh, companies. So it's I, the thing is that it, I think that as an image, um, if you can, it's it's one of those things where it's the legal precedent is still being set. Uh, we didn't go to court. I mean, we didn't go to trial. We just threatened to sue them, and they settled with us, which was which was better because we couldn't have afforded to do that anyway. But what's that? Right. Yeah. It doesn't I mean you were right. They probably were like, okay. Yeah. Well, they. I don't. They could have just told us to. Yeah. Anyway. They, when you do a painting, <laughs> is there a contract uh, that you sign that? Suggest how long that painting must remain. I do like to have those, yes, because you know you, you spend uh, a few weeks on something and you put all this energy is into it, it. Is that common? It or? is. Okay. It is common, but oftentimes if it's paid, if somebody paid me to do it, uh, typically they're they're going to want to keep it around for a while, yeah. anyhow. I don't know the the uh, background to this, but there's a uh, a graphic uh, of a rainbow painted on the side of a building in Detroit. Yes. And that building, uh, the uh, new owner of the building was converting it into, uh, it was probably an office building at one time, was converting it into lofts or apartments. And the requirement, uh, there, it, it, somehow it was imposed that the, uh, this wall, which had no windows, was to remain appearing the same. Yep. And this became a project at the University of Michigan School of Architecture to figure out a way to maintain the appearance of the rainbow mm -hmm. and still allow uh, uh, the ability to put so, windows. So that was, she was using VARA. She was using that VARA act uh, because, uh, and successfully, <laughs> very successfully there. Um, I, I think that it's, is it still ongoing? Did she, she win that or? Well, I, 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 it just so happens that my uh, grandson's girlfriend was on that project mm -hmm. from U of M architecture. And I don't know any real background to it. But they did successfully uh, create a design that apparently was accepted mm -hmm. and met all the requirements, whether they were the the city's requirements, or the artist's requirements, or the building owner's requirements, I don't know. It seemed like the city and or the artist had, had the, uh, the, the uh, most importance in making this, uh, maintaining this mural. Mm. Hmm. I, um, I, I, just, uh, I just wanted to address, the, the guy who asked me that question and said that People can take photos of anything they want, and and it's theirs. Um, basically, that's I, I don't see how that's true at all. Um, I, think it's the, I think it's probably. <laughs> I don't see it. I think it's going to come down to like it's, the context of the photograph. I mean, 
So I imagine, like, I don't when know where it's going, but like, I imagine if you are taking like a broader picture and there happened to be a section of a mural in that, right? That's different than, like, well, taking for, a photograph of the mural. For instance, people film in New York City all the time, and they get murals in them, and sometimes they're smart enough to not put the mural in there, or sometimes they want it in there for for whatever reason, and I get contacted all the time for to yeah. sign off. Because they have to ask. Yeah. Uh, and they have a budget. They usually will give you a little bit of money for doing that. It's in the production budget. But they have to ask. Yeah. I mean, anyway. that leads me to believe that the law is the other way. Because every, like, every why, time why would they go out of their way if they didn't? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yes? Uh, so I have a question about context. We talked about um, kind of the context of the wall itself that being a unique wall. And there were walls that you wanted to paint on because of either the architecture or its surface or what have you. And you even talked a little bit about the context of the crown. Mm -hmm. uh, on the people's the crown is slightly different in, in Detroit, think maybe in another city, um, which is really fantastic. I, one of the things that I think when you build something in the landscape, and I'm thinking about this, I apologize through the lens of an architect, but when you build something in the landscape, that's not your context, it's not your culture. Mm. But, I mean, I, we could say, okay, your, your work is very much about New York. I mean, you're, you're a product of New York and, and the art scene there, to the point that McDonald's identified something you, you did as <laughs> New York, right? And so, but then when you go to Rome, for instance, and you place uh, your work on a wall in Rome, right, and it's, and it's your art, it's, it's a, in a lot of ways, it's kind of a cultural transfer, right? Like, mm -hmm. Of what your expression is as, as an artist in New York, and now it's in the streets in the context of Rome. And do you ever encounter either dilemmas about that? Absolutely. Yeah. I just, I just want to hear your thoughts on that. You guys are it's hitting all the hottest topics. This is great. It's like a cultural appropriation thing, but like yeah, it's, like it's reverse. It, well, it, uh, there's, so along with, with developers and, and um, yeah. along with developers and and corporations and uh, ad agencies being very interested in, in bringing murals and mural art uh, into things, uh, there's also these street art festivals all in cities all over the world, and, and sometimes they're used to reinvigorate a community, or that's the kind of guys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it's like, uh, and sometimes they're even uh, paid for by developers as a sort of first, you know, step. And and it's looked on negatively in a lot of in a, a lot of instances because of that. It's just you're just parachuting in a bunch of artists, don't know anything about this area, and uh, they're creating work that the people there don't have any say in, and they have to live with it. So um, I really try to do stuff to, to to create works in in places that are, is informed by those places as much as I can. Um, so yeah, it's a dilemma. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, yep. It's, it's another. That's another serious topic that's going around about. It's a whole other like. <laughs> it's a bit. Yeah, it's a big yeah, one. Like, yeah. Yes. Okay, kind of rewinding back to your process with the murals. How do you decide which paint to use on the wall? Is it dependent on the material or the surface of it? Yeah. 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 Great. Great question. So, like, like I was saying, how the, every wall has different challenges: the logistics, the, the texture the size. Um, uh, so it's, it's helpful to have as many tools in the toolbox as possible. So really, uh, if you want something to last, you know, you, you want to start with exterior house paint. It's just really the best thing you could do. Uh, I use a lot of spray paint, too, because it's fast and because your, your colors are pre-mixed. Um, and it, it is, it's an industrial material. It, it, it will last. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to be out there painting with my my little oil colors, you know, it's just not, <laughs> it's not practical. Um, so, but, but again, one of, the, one of the things that people really appreciate about uh, work on the street is that it is kind of ephemeral. So a lot of artists that do wheat paste, a lot of artists just work with uh, oil crayon on the street. Uh, these, these are things that you kind of have to find in time before they're either buffed out or the weather gets to them or they fade away. So you, you want things to last a, a reasonable amount of time, particularly when it's a big job, a big endeavor that takes a lot of energy. But you know, these things are, aren't really meant to last forever. So. What's the, what's the typical time frame for a mural like 
to how long it'll last? Yeah. Um, I don't even know. I haven't even been doing this long enough to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would hope. I you would think. the tags. <laughs> right, right. Well, if it's like up high and it's getting a lot of sun, yeah. um, if you're using stuff that's fairly, pigments that are fairly light fast, it, it should last 10 years, I think. There's also um, UV clear coat stuff that people put, that also helps to repel graffiti or you can wash graffiti off. Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, yep? The um, Dubai project that you had, which was obviously much more difficult because you had three dimensional half column. Mm -hmm. When you did that, you know, that's a very familiar, uh, that is, uh, it's very similar to an agama, the Akova agama, I'm sure you're familiar mm -hmm. with that. Yeah, yeah. Were you in any way uh, influenced, at least on a conscious level, that you were doing I, I mean, I'm familiar with Agam's work, of course. Uh, I think that I, there's a lot of, there's a lot of artists that, that utilize lenticular. Um, so maybe, you know, I mean, we're, we're all we're always taking in information and we're like sponges, right? And then. It's hard to, hard to know where you're getting but you certain things from. Without yes. So, it, it, correct. Uh, I was not thinking of him. But you're not the first person to bring up his name in reference to that mural. You, somebody else in New York actually uh, yeah, asked. What's that? We want to be more difficult projects because of the three dimensional element that you have to deal with. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you get up on the left, you paint a little bit, then you get down, and you make sure it works, and then you get back up. Yeah, it was. It was. It was a. It was a fun challenge, though. That was a beautiful piece. Thank you. Yes. So I know in England, this was a few years ago, where they had this controversy as to why the ladies do So when you said buying the rights to, do you mean the Banksy's being cut out of the wall? Yeah, so like that happened Banksy, here too. So like yeah. Like right. I mean, I would be okay with people trying to cut my my art out and sell it for a million dollars. That'd be fun. <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> no. In fact, I do know people that work for him, and he, and the reason why they don't, um, why he doesn't authenticate it, is because he wants that work to live on the street. It was created for that. Corner. It was, it was very. His work is very specific, as I think any thoughtful artist would be when they're working on the street. Yeah, it's all about the context. So, so uh, I think a lot of people were very upset because why? Like you're gonna you're gonna take this thing off the street where everyone can enjoy it. Like it's this egalitarian experience, and then you're gonna sell it for a million dollars and put it in some somebody's house. It's just. It, it defeats the whole purpose of why the art was created in the first place. The, the three pieces that he did when he came to Detroit um, lasted maybe a whole three days, maybe a whole two days. So one was There's stolen one. before the sun came up. Yeah. The other one, some guy was with a bucket of white paint, and these girls were like, you're going to erase um, like $200,000. Like, I don't care. And he just buffed it, and then another one got stolen mm -hmm. like two days later. Yeah, there was one in the Packard, wasn't there? Yeah, the Packard plan. Was I remember some people that were searching for that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. It disappeared, I thought. So, um, before I ask my question, I wanted to ask another question, which was that the, the work that was in Rome, the, the text that was on there, that you said that was there before. And yes. Avoid it. Yeah, I was being respectful. Yeah. So, I'm just wondering, since the work is, you know, all, all the work that you show, maybe I missed it, but it's, it's like right when it's done and there's nothing that's been added to it. And I was just wondering if you, what's your, what are your feelings about the work getting tagged or becoming part of the palimpsest of the city? You know, it's like you're, you're adding, you're adding a layer onto the building. Mm -hmm. So if somebody else is adding things to yours, is that something that you... Uh, the initial gut reaction is, not good. <laughs> yeah, you're upset because you spent all this time on something and then somebody comes along and within three seconds can just cause, you know, kind of, uh, it's, it's the amount of time it didn't take me to, 
to fix it versus the amount. Anyway, it, 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 initially, it is upsetting. But I get what you're saying. I think that <clears throat> something, especially at street level, it's a living part of the city. Exactly. Uh, I'm not. Yeah, it, it's it's to be expected. I'll get you know. I'll say that much. Um, I'm not saying that that's my little patch of wall forever. Definitely not. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely something that I kind of wrestle with. Uh, it's it's rare though. I, I I rarely have had work get uh, get tagged. London, forget about it. If I put something up within <laughs> within a month, it's just it's getting hit. Yeah. Also, I'm not from there. It, it's very Territorial, so, so I think that the respect factor depends on how much time. Uh, you know, if you're if you're a, a name that everybody knows there, if, um, yeah. But is the work, for instance, has anyone tag your work in a way? Um, I mean, I guess I think of tagging as being something that's not very site specific. So it's mm -hmm. Like something that like that was sort of worked into it and just be, and it just kind of yeah, added yeah, or. I think of like a dog marking. Yeah, I'll wait for that to happen. That'd be great. <laughs> if it was, uh, you know, a collaborator that uh, you know I'll never meet. You know, just kind of. Now, typically though, it's I think it's people wanting to to disrespect what you're doing, or it's called side busting, where you put your name next to somebody else's bigger piece so that it gets in the Instagram photos. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've had unexpected collaborators. Somebody threw yeah. ping balls at one of our pieces. Oh, there they you go. made some nice splash. Yeah. So, um, well, the whole, well, you're asking if it's on a personal level or if it's just them doing it on their own? Yeah, like, just because we've worked so hard and we have these pieces, I mean, there's this whole other aspect of these people seeing your pieces and having this moment, mm -hmm. like, outside of their daily lives where it's like, whoa, this is like yeah. a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, and, and I do, I love that that's, it's still a thing that's, it's a, it's a record that's left there that, that people will continue to uh, ha hopefully have those moments with. But the, 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 the personal moments that happen are, are really the most rewarding. Uh, because pe when, when people communicate with you, you know, some, sometimes I'm, I'm up there working and I, and I, uh, I can't really talk to people. But the, the best part is when, when I'm stepping back from a piece to, to see how it looks. And someone will come up and just have a candid conversation. and. Uh, and this, it's usually gratitude. Rarely is it the opposite. <laughs> Sometimes people, some, you know, it's, people won't, really won't take the time to, to talk to you if, if they're not usually that into it. So maybe I get a skewed view. Maybe, maybe I'm looking through rose-colored glasses because people always say nice things. But <laughs> yep. Fantastic question. In fact, I'm working on an exterior mosaic right now. I mean, not you know, in Detroit uh, for the for the murals in the market that's uh, going on right now. Yeah, do so. Announce what's happening tonight, the art after dark. <clears throat> event, and yeah. Come see the work. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, it's still in process. I've just started putting up. It was uh, it was it was actually really challenging to to uh, to take what I was doing in the studio because I was installing these these mosaics into panels that I was laying flat, building them flat. Then you know, putting the adhesive down and grout and everything. Then by the time I raise them up, they're solid as rock. Uh, but trying to trying to build these things in the studio and then slap it up on a wall, it's like a whole different challenge. Uh, so it's in process right now, and it should be done uh, by the end of the weekend. So, but yeah, it's a great question. It's 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 that was immediately one of my like the next stage of the ambition. I thought it would be really cool to create these. These little treasures that you could find. This one's actually in a bricked over doorway. So, uh, you know, a bricked over window would be really cool. Anything that's kind of sunken in, that, uh, any, that unexpected factor is kind of the, the biggest thing. So, great question. Thanks. Anybody? Yeah? 
Oh, so Eastern Market. And tonight is actually the kind of like the closing or the big the big to do. So uh, Eastern Market after dark, all the businesses uh, kind of have the, their doors open, and most of the murals are done, um, except for mine. <laughs> <laughs> but I am hand to be fair, I'm hand breaking little pieces of stone and breaking glass. <laughs> it takes a really long time. Yeah. And now you are still going. Now that you explore animation and, for example, stop motion, computer animation, have you ever considered like projecting them? Out in the open yeah, 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 definitely. I've done it a couple of times. And like, do you guys familiar with D-Electricity? I think that was last week. Uh, I, I wanted to apply to that. I didn't have time. But that's, that's a great example of a, an outdoor festival that does light-based work uh, and, pr and oftentimes projects it on the sides of buildings. And I think I was, I was in one somewhere in Florida this year where I just sent them the file. I didn't even actually get to see it, but I hope, I hope it looked good. Yeah. All right, I think that's, that's all the time we have. Thank you all, and go to Easter Market tonight. <laughs>